we had uh, for uh, uh, this particular panel, which is how does community construct method in the global south? And we will start with you, Mahua. Thank you, uh, everyone. It's very nice meeting everyone. I have heard of uh, you all in many ways. So it's very nice uh, being here. And thank you, Mohan, for organizing this. And thank you for the prompt. Uh, so how does community construct method in the Global South? Uh, you know, as I was reflecting on the question, I think the uh, the very framing of the question offers it a social justice orientation. Uh, the key words here being like normally what we, the way we construct or we have heard uh, questions being constructed are how do we construct method to understand communities in the global south. So when we hear a question like that, how does community construct method, that itself I think uh, uh, offers a certain orientation to a particular academic project. So the key words here being global south and community and especially from my own research uh, uh, like program, the way I was thinking of community was, um, you know, the communities uh, as organizations of struggle. Uh, that is how I was thinking of community. And of course, there is no fixed or stable notion of a community. Communities come together in many different ways over many different issues. Uh, communities have, of course, uh, histories that constitute them. Uh, the local histories, local politics, which are intricately, again, connected to a larger uh, global economy. And when we think of uh, the global south, it is, of course, not just a geographical construct. It is an ideal um, so it is an ideological political construct, it's a space embroiled in relational geopolitics, um, a certain uh, normative space for knowledge production. Um, so knowledge the basis production. of, sorry, I'm echoing a little bit, so I'm getting a little uh, distracted by the echo, sorry about that. Uh, the so so as I was saying that you know the South it is the basis of colonization as an uh, instrument of capitalist expansion. What does it mean when we turn to the global South for knowledge? That itself inverts the process of knowledge production that has dominantly, dominantly been intertwined with the colonial project. So communities with that caveat, that understanding of uh, the global south as a political enterprise and the community as an organization of struggle. Sorry, 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 Can you hear me now? Okay. So, so communities construct method through embodied nature of, uh, you know, lived struggles in the extractive spaces of the South. That is how, how I, uh, look at it. Their very method of organizing is knowledge in itself uh, because, you know, those are spaces of knowledge generation. So, so uh, I was thinking of my own research project. Uh, one second, I just lost the visuals for some reason. I'm sorry. Give me one second. I lost the Can you see me? Okay. Yes, yeah. yes, we can see you. Yeah. Yeah. I just lost the uh, Zoom visual. So the very method of organizing by the communities in the global south is knowledge in itself. Uh, I was thinking of my own uh, work with the farmers in Shingur movement in 
uh, rural India and the the organizing of the community is informed by the by the history by the uh, by the by their own religious practices by the local cultural codes and uh, local cultural uh, norms so one of the ways i shingur movement a section of farmers they organized was the uh, principle of nonviolence and that organizing is knowledge in itself you know that is uh, that is the epistemology of the south the practice of nonviolence uh, i was also thinking of the chipko movement how the tree hugging by itself they organized through the practice of uh, tree hugging which gives us a different relational model of uh, the community so the way they organized uh, the these communities they that very method of organizing is knowledge in itself so going back to how communities construct method i argue that they that it is an embodied nature of lived struggle in the extractive spaces of the south uh, the method and theorizing emergent from the south is rooted in contextually based everyday lived empiricisms and in universal imagination for freedom and equality uh, what i noticed in my own research sites are that the decentralized decision making non hierarchy participatory forms of organizing and decision making and again these organizing principles are rooted in an ideology that creates horizontal networks instead of top down practices instead of drop down structures based on philosophies of greater democracy so uh, so what we can learn from this uh, method of organizing is that this method itself uh, is a call to democratizing the spaces of theorizing it recognizing it recognizes the pluralisms of academic work that are carried out by people communities activ activists it's a network it's a solidarity network uh communities again constructing method offer empiricisms that are incompatible with the western knowledge system uh predominantly us based theories uh rather they teach us that empirical learnings emerging from the south create openings for dismantling dominant theories uh demonstrating their limits and simultaneously creating new logics so i think those are my few points about uh you know when i think about uh, how communities construct their method so thank you thank you so much uh, mohua um uh, asha shall we move to you yeah sure okay so please let me know when uh, you know if you if you if you cannot hear me because i've been having uh, this internet internet uh, connection it's really bad around here okay so um uh to uh, thank you mohan thank you to mohan and uh, and and breeze and uh, the team uh, for inviting me uh, um uh okay so going back to my own uh ways of uh, or my you know to to answer this question i would go back to what uh, uh mahuya had uh, had mentioned earlier right so it goes back to the social justice uh framework of looking at how communities can construct method in uh, in the global south so um my experience or my shri is actually based on my experience of uh, engaging with the indian community in the plantation economy uh, in malaysia in one of the rural areas here in the southern state of uh, malaysia um so um uh what i found and this was a study that was done in 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 uh, 2016 so what i found was that the understanding of this community is very much uh, based on contacts uh in in other words history matters so um uh, for, for 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 those of you who do not know uh, the history the malaysian indians are the marginalized community in malaysia so that has implications in all spheres that affect their lives and livelihood so the understanding of this community is must be seen within or against that backdrop where um there's a lot of struggles the challenges uh 
even challenges for someone who's, uh, you know, um, who's belonging to that community. I belong to that community. But even then, right, so there are a lot of challenges in terms of the identity, um, right? So the, the um, for someone who belongs to, so the, the question of the uh, we versus the us, right, or, or them, right? So that kind of, uh, a lot of those kind of things. But I also found that, you know, the ways that the, um, the, the communities came together or the, the ways of uh, organizing uh, seemed seem to, to uh, decolonize the systematic way of doing research, right? So in that, side, in that sense, uh, working with uh, the different stakeholders, but at the same time, I think where the focus was, it was to understand this community through its, its, its project and using the castles way of understanding things, right? The history surrounding their struggles, their resistance, their challenges, right? But at the same time also, uh, in looking or, or in focusing on community education, uh, community mobilization and advocacy. So that's the, the, the framework. So it's very much back to the social justice uh, framework of looking at um, methods in the, in the global south. Thank you so much, Asha. Um, you know, it seems like we are converging on this social justice anchor. Uh, perhaps uh, we can move to you, Vinod. Thank you, Mohan, uh, for having me in this uh, panel. Uh, I think uh, Mao has uh, made a great start uh, and has pretty much uh, said a lot of things that uh, all of us would agree with and, uh, uh, you know, would, would like to say ourselves. Uh, so I, I'll try and avoid uh, too much of a repetition, uh, you know, from from what uh, Mahua and uh, Asha following her have said. Uh, in response to your first prompt, I just would like to uh, say something by way of context. When we say community, uh, my own work uh, for the last uh, twenty years or so has been with uh, primarily uh, rural and agrarian communities uh, in India. And I think it's important for us to understand the rural context in much of the global south uh, today. I mean, uh, it's actually no longer the case that most of the world's population lives in the countryside uh, any, any longer. I mean, data from UN agencies suggest that less than 50% of the world population now lives in rural areas. Uh, I mean, neoliberal economic policies, the negative effects of climate change have made agriculture less and less viable with uh, declining farm incomes, especially for uh, many of these small farmer communities uh, with, with whom I uh, engage. Uh, corporate style commercial farming on a large scale, the setting up of special economic zones for industry, the encroaching of rural spaces by the urban rich and the middle class for luxury gated communities, weekend farmhouses, etc. I mean, have resulted in large scale acquisition of farmlands and a general decline in common property resources, including water, grazing land for cattle and forests. I mean, we are still sort of uh, mourning uh, the passing of uh, Sundarlal Bahuguna and many of these issues were foregrounded by him decades ago. I mean, these trends uh, are visible, especially during the last two decades of intensification of the process of globalization, free market liberalization. I mean, they have created a dire uh, situation for impoverished rural poor who have been forced to migrate to the cities, hoping to make a decent living there. Uh, a significant uh, sort of socio-political dimension of this uh, relentless process of pauperization of the rural poor is, uh, from a communication point of view, is a loss of voice and the inability to have a say in decision making at the local, state and uh, central levels that have had uh, an adverse effect on their lives and livelihoods. Several scholars have talked about it, including uh, uh, Mohan's uh, own work. Uh, 
So the communication inequalities across uh, class divides, uh, what Mohan had called uh, disclassive erasures with large numbers of the poor and marginalized people uh, rendered silent in the public sphere. That's a real important issue for us uh, communication scholars. So when we talk about community, I think like Kamawa and Asha have talked about, I mean, the context is very important. It's not a monolithic entity. Uh, we are talking of diverse communities, uh, you know, separated along uh, gender, caste, class, race, religion, etc. Those of us who are involved in communication for social change, research and practice must think of those who are most vulnerable to unjust structural conditions of neoliberal economics, poverty, ill health, etc. as a community uh, in point. I mean, that's the community we are talking about that is defined by precarity. So material conditions defined by precarity, but if you look at it culturally uh, and from a communication perspective, we are talking of a community defined by a certain ethos of care, uh, sharing, uh, a, a sense of solidarity, and a community defined by uh, mutual cognitive uh, respect. Uh, so when, when uh, Mohan asked, how does community construct method? Uh, I would say communities methods are constructed through uh, shared experiences of deprivation and suffering, but also through uh, everyday forms of resistance against oppressive structures. Uh, from certain, uh, I don't know, uh, that's the right word, from certain innate abilities capabilities, if you will, that are a product of uh, particular socioeconomic, political context, and a particular cultural milieu through which their methods emerge. Uh, I have uh, lots of uh, examples I could give from uh, our own work, but I'll, I'll wait for the uh, sec second round and, and uh, listen to Pradeep and Anisya. Thank you, Mohan. So much, uh, you know, how, how powerful, you know, the registers you have offered us in terms of thinking through uh, both the ethos of care and, and learning from that in terms of principles of resistance. Um, uh, Pradeep? Yep. Um, well, um, let me begin by thanking you, uh, Mohan, um, for this invitation and also all the speakers who went before Mahua, Asha, and, and Vinod for setting the scene um, and making my life a lot easier. Um, I think, you know, when I look at my own um, kind of involvement um, in, in fieldwork in India, um, I must say that I haven't done proper fieldwork since 2016. Even then, I think it was pretty episodic. Um, and I haven't worked with kind of really kind of um, marginalized communities um, in, a, in a kind of really intense kind of way for, for a long time, right? Um, but I, I'm what I'm going to say today is going to be based on what I did in 2016 and my own, my own understanding of method. So to me, um, so 2016, I was involved in, um, you know, some kind of bit of field work with a community called the Irulas. And some of you may know the Irulas. The Irulas are a, a South Indian so-called tribe, Adivasi kind of tribe, um, involved in snake catching. And now the reason why I say all this is because I have an interest in natural history. Right? And I'm very interested in the creepy crawlies and things like that. Uh, so my history of working with Irulas goes back to my own, when I go back to Chennai and I've got nothing better to do, my, my brother and myself go and do a bit of snake catching with the Irulas, right? Uh, and, and I've learned in, the, in that informal setting, I've kind of learned a bit about Irulas and Irula culture and Irula, Irula methods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also apart from that, I, I've, I've kind of interviewed them and gone and you know visited them and and so on and so forth as part of some ongoing fieldwork. So the way I see me, my lights go off here one second. Okay, the way I see method is that um, there are two ways of looking at method. Method that is kind of vocation specific, um, that is germane to a specific occupation, that is also based on cultural knowledge. Right? Uh, for example, it could be agriculture. It could be weaving. It could be snake catching, uh, whatever, right? There is that kind of method that people have, right? 
that, uh, that, that communities have. Often this is kind of inherited, based on inherited knowledge uh, that enables people to kind of, or communities to assess, evaluate, plan, implement actions that are productive, you know, in their own spheres of life. So in other words, here, here, are, you know, here I'm talking about methods that are based on local knowledge, tried and tested, not based on the kinds of textbooks, methods and textbooks, right? Um, so methods that are part of a community. So like I said, the Irulas are, are a, a scheduled tribe who live in parts of South India with their strongest concentrations in Southern India, especially in Tamil Nadu. There are about 22,000 households. Their total Irula population in Tamil Nadu is about 156,000. And they typically live in scattered communities. Now, they used to be hunter-gatherers, considered as hunter-gatherers. They used to kind of hunt snakes for the skin trade. And then in 1972 or 1976, there was a ban on this trade by the then Mrs. Gandhi's government. Um, and they lost a, a major source of their income. Okay, So today, they've got a couple of cooperatives. Uh, some of them are involved in kind of you know, milking snakes for the anti-venom industry. And the women are involved in in, in the uh, production of uh, medicinal plants, um, and and so on and so forth. Now, so there is that kind of inherited knowledge that they have, and in, in, inherited methods. They've got extensive ethnobotanical knowledge of medicinal plants, um, and at the same time, extensive knowledge and methods with respect to reptile behavior, right? And that is that is that is germane to them. That's part of who they are, what they are, and all the rest of it. So that's one way of understanding method, right? Um, the second way is method has kind of received knowledge right, by these communities. And here I want to go back to, and, and here I want to talk about method in the context of social justice and development, and not in India, but in, 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 in Mexico, right? Some of you have probably come across the organization Rhizomatica, which is an NGO that is based in, in, in Mexico. And, and what they've been involved in is this is an NGO that's based in Mexico that have been involved in setting up telecom cooperatives with indigenous communities, right? Um, and telecom cooperatives themselves are pretty radical, right? Um, I mean, it'd be wonderful to have telecom cooperatives in, say, South Asia, but we don't have any of them. Um, but, but the reality in, in Mexico is that this particular group, Rhizomatica, working in the area of Chiapas, um, they've been able to kind of um, strengthen local communities by, by engaging with them on this whole process of building um, local telecoms. Now, the interesting thing with respect to Chiapas and the indigenous communities there is that many of these many of these communities have had prior experience of social justice, of solidarities, of working on community radio, right? So it was easy for Rhizomatica to work with them in terms of methods, okay? But one of, the, one of the key things that I learned from, um, from Rhizomatica and these communities is that these communities, uh, you know, um, had a pretty, they were pretty categorical in their refusal to be dependent on the dominant telecom providers. They had a sense of justice, right? They had a sense of independence and autonomy and solidarity, right? Which helped them a lot in, in, in the context of you know, their own, you know, in, in terms of the methods in the context of their own community development in the context of, 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 of working on those of telecom co-ops. So they know they knew exactly what they wanted, right? Um, and that clarity made it easier for Rhizomatica to be involved in capacity building in creating local knowledge that in turn became the basis for successful methods in community organizing operation, operationalized by these local communities. Um, I think the question here has to do with, you know, you know, the process by which methods are arrived at, right? In the context of Rhizomatica, there was a process because they had an exit strategy, right? Uh, they were not, they didn't believe in being in that community for X number of years. And this is one of the big, you know, issues in the context of community organizing in India, right? Especially with NGOs uh, who don't have an exit strategy and we know knows very well what I'm talking about here. You know, the you know, NGOs that continue to exist for you know donkey's years and don't allow local communities to develop their own methods. Right? In the context of Rhizomatica, they had a pretty clear exit strategy. And with the result, you know, they, they've kind of moved on. But the communities have been left with 
you know, strong methods that they use in the context of evaluating, in the context of planning, in the context of strategizing, right? So I just want to leave it at that at the moment. There are, you know, for me, there are two types of methods. One is a method that is kind of received knowledge that communities have. And the second one is the methods that could be, uh, you know, you know, could, could, you know, methods that, that NGOs and others are involved in kind of um, in complementing their kind of received knowledge, right? So it's it's at that two levels that I just, you know, you know that 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 I thought be useful in our discussions today. I leave it at that. Moon. Yeah, uh, Pradeep, I'll just do a quick summary of this round and what we have uh, so far. I mean, this has been such uh, beautiful articulations from all four of you, Mohua. Um, you talked about um, uh, so profoundly in terms of uh, thinking about the question as a question of social justice itself in terms of really driving through um, uh, the politics of methods, thinking about what are the ways in which communities construct methods, placing the power in the hands of communities. So you talked about uh, situating this amidst uh, struggles, uh, uh, struggles for knowledge, but knowledge itself located uh, within struggles. You connected that to methods of um, organizing uh, that are embodied and built into the lived struggles. And uh, then you uh, connected that to notions of um, uh, pluralizing the many uh, registers through which uh, solidarity can be built uh, uh, through uh, methods. Asha, uh, you again you know, brought us back to the social justice framework. And uh, from within uh, the context of your own work with the Indian plantation workers in Malaysia, you uh, pointed to the notion of history and how history matters within that context, particularly in terms of the coolie trade and the um, um, imperial politics of trade and labor that constitutes that history. You also um, uh, sort of uh, connected this to the notions of community um, education, community mobilization and advocacy and situating methods within that role of advocacy. You know, Vinod, um, how powerfully you talked about uh, this notion of recognizing that context is not monolithic, context is imbued with complexities and um, heterogeneities. And then, uh, you know, from that thinking about method within the question of the ethos of care, solidarity, um, and uh, uh, sort of, you know, building uh, this multiple mutual uh, register for cognitive respect or mutual cognitive uh, respect that draws upon, you know, you talked about two things, shared experiences of deprivation and then um, everyday forms of resistance, you know, powerful. And then <coughs> Pradeep, you sort of outlined uh, method, um, you know, thinking through methods in two ways. One is um, inherited uh, methods uh, within uh, communities that are uh, built upon uh, the received knowledge and prior experiences of communities, methods that actually draw upon uh, 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 practices that are held within communities. So, um, uh, you know, your work um, uh, with the uh, Irulas, and you talked about the methods, both in terms of ethnobotany, but also in terms of methods of reptilian behavior and knowledge of reptilian behavior. And then you talked about this notion of methods as complementary. And you gave that example of uh, rhizomatic in terms of how do methods within the NGO sector, within uh, movements connect with um, uh, struggles within communities. So this is a nice uh, segue to our next prompt, which is uh, with the concept of solidarity. How is solidarity conceptualized in academic relationships with community in the global South? So perhaps Asha, we can uh, start with you and then go to you, Pradeep, uh, then go to you, Vinod, then Pradeep, and then Mahua. Okay, thank you, Mohan. All right, so this is always uh, a struggle, uh, especially with uh, the academic relationship and, and, and community, right? So obviously the simple answer to this question would be, just being truthful to yourself and share, sharing solidarity with the communities. But it's also the question of how and what does solidarity look like when you're supposedly in a, in a, in a privileged uh, position, right? So um, a lot of uh, this, I mean, the, the sharing uh, for this uh, 
comes from the, the previous panel where Ichar talks about how uh, solidarity itself is a very difficult concept to grasp, right? So actually, and, 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 and she makes a very good point about how, uh, you know, you don't, you, it, it's not just the words, right? So it's the action, right? So action speaks louder than words. So uh, for me, the care work has definitely built, um, uh, it's it built that strength, uh, but also to know that, 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 uh, to know and also to become, um, you know, uh, accustomed to to the challenges that surrounds uh, uh, solidarity, right? So, the challenges of uh, what's what's uh, surrounds uh, solidarity, right? So, it's the question of power, the question of uh, privilege, status, class, and ranks, right? So, honestly, this is work in progress for me. Uh, and um, so just to share a little bit about uh, the project that I was involved in with the Malaysian Indians in, in, in Malaysia, right? So, um, you know, being part of the community, I belong, I'm an Indian myself, so, but belonging to that community does not make me an insider, right? So uh, I'm still considered an outsider, although I'm an Indian and I, I share the sentiments of the community, right? So uh, then it's the question of positionality. Um, the question of how much emotion can you employ, right? So, or should, you know, uh, how do you, so this is the question I get all the time, right? So it's not, it was, that started with my, even my PhD dissertation that I worked on the, the minority Indians and the marginalized uh, uh, situation in, in, in Malaysia, right? So how do you position yourself, right? You, you being an Indian, right? So, and of course that um, has an effect on solidarity, right? So, uh, so, but here, I think there was a, uh, it was also from the previous panel, I, 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 I noted that there is a need to focus on embodiment and integrity, right? So the values that you hold and how that becomes central to community engagement, uh, to community uh, 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 engagement as well as the mobilization and advocacy, right? How do you work with that, right? Um, so I had gone through some of these struggles myself, right? So just getting approval for the project in Malaysia was 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 hell, right? So of course my care um, uh, colleagues would know this, um, right? So uh, and and especially when you're seen as a suspect, okay, suspect uh, as in being a minority in this country, right? Uh, even after getting approval, my uh, existence in this estate, whenever I went and did the interviews, I did about 44 interviews with uh, the participants in this remote area in, in Malaysia. You know, uh, you know, whenever I went there, I'm always looked at, like I said, right? So you're an outsider, you're, you're, you belong to a, to a very uh, uh, prestigious university outside of the country, right? So all of those matters, right? So while conducting uh, the interviews, at one point, I remember, um, and uh, I mean, it, this is this is so clear, right, in my mind, right. So uh, uh, while conducting the interviews, one of the estate leaders, an Indian himself, right, came and stopped those interviews, right. Just just got us to disperse, uh, and even though I showed the 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 documents uh, to him, the approval documents, I was, you know, we we just had to, and this is coming from an Indian. Uh, in the community, right? So, uh, and since then, it has it has always been watch out for the red car or watch out from this 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 Indian woman who's coming from the 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 uh, from another uh, uh, university from outside the you know that kind of thing, right? So, so all of this actually it's 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 a struggle, right? Those are the challenges, especially when you talk about how do you land yourself uh, in terms of uh, you know building that solidarity with the communities, right? Uh, so obviously here they did not want the stories to be told, right? So no one from the outside should know what was happening in the communities. And um, so that that includes, um, you know, even for someone who is who is a citizen of this country, right? And who belongs to the community. So you can imagine the kind of uh, struggles. Um, so that with that, I think um, I would like to end it here. Thank you. Can you hear me? That's it. Thanks, Asha. Um, uh, 
Vinod? Yeah. Um, yeah, if you uh, look at uh, this issue of uh, academic relationships with the uh, community in the global south, uh, a, a little bit of uh, sort of historical trajectory is also uh, relevant. I mean, if you uh, look at it uh, within the context of uh, uh, development discourse in the uh, and, and practice in, in the global south, uh, for example, agricultural universities uh, for a long time had, had uh, put in place uh, sort of the extension philosophy of, of communicating with communities, engaging with communities, the old sort of lab to land uh, kind of approach. But as, as we all know, this, is, uh, this was mostly expert driven, had a certain hierarchical relationship of communication and knowledge transmission and so on. But more recently, especially coming out of uh, sort of global north uh, uh, academic institutions, I, I find uh, community engagement as, as uh, sort of a new sort of a buzzword. I mean, right? I mean, a lot of exchange students coming into uh, India and other parts of global south, uh, you know, talking about they're wanting to do some community engagement projects and so on, you know, wanting to do rural immersion projects and so on. Uh, it has a certain social work dimension, uh, uh, a certain kind of a benign do-gooder role. I mean, so the, so the question is, I mean, I mean, I haven't uh, thought through this very carefully, but you, you could construct a certain typology of uh, uh, modes of solidarity with community in the last 40, 50 years. Uh, there could be others, but you know, these are two typical things that I, uh, I could find. And there is a need certainly to invert this, to construct a more creative, more sustained partnership between the community and the academia. Uh, I'm also very conscious that, you know, I think Mon and uh, some of us were talking about it in another platform recently, that hierarchy and one's own location within institutional academic structures, uh, you know, that come with their own imperatives and demands of publishing in high impact journals, being able to defend what one does as legitimate academic work and so on. So people turn around and say, I mean, the kind of things that Mohan does in, in, in Bengal and other places, I mean, is that really academic work? Uh, you know, I mean, and, and Mohan and his team has, of course, found all kinds of ways of meeting those demands as well. So I'm conscious of some of this out of the box thinking uh, about building solidarities with communities coming from a certain privileged space within the academia. I mean, let's, let's bracket that for, for a minute. Uh, but let me give you a couple of quick examples of the kind of work uh, we have done with communities in the last 20 years or so, just to uh, you know, give you some ideas of the modes of partnership. Uh, in uh, 2020, the then, uh, I'm sorry, in, in uh, 2000, not 2020, 2020 seems like so long ago, but you know, I'm, I'm talking about uh, the year 2000 when the then government of Andhra Pradesh, uh, led by Chandra Babu Naidu, uh, laid out a vision 2020 plan, yeah, uh, an agricultural action plan of the government, which was very problematic. A lot of activists and uh, social movements were questioning it. It, it literally was eliminating uh, small farmers and, and uh, small scale farming as unviable, ushering in uh, corporate style agriculture, you know, Israeli style, uh, you know, corporate agriculture on a big scale. Uh, one of the communities with whom I work uh, closely and have been working for the last 20 years is an organization called Deccan Development Society, uh, which works with uh, uh, a large group of uh, Dalit uh, women farmers in a dryland agriculture area, not too far from Hyderabad. Uh, so that organization has decided to create uh, a sort of a people's uh, jury, a farmer's jury on the agricultural action plan. And I was quite uh, closely associated and my own department was closely associated with that. Uh, so we did some of the participatory research 
for selection of the jury, uh, which consisted of small farmers across the three different regions of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, so we did field level interviews and selected about 19 uh, jury members. Uh, it consisted of Dalit, Adivasi, women farmers, the ones who would be most affected by this agricultural action plan. Uh, that there would be smaller marginal farmers living near or below the poverty line, uh, that they would not be closely connected with NGOs or political parties, uh, and, and so on. It was an amazing exercise for one week in this small village uh, in this area. It was an exercise in deliberative democracy, uh, citizen empowerment, uh, you know, bringing in deliberative and inclusive processes. I mean, we were very conscious that there was a crisis in representative democracy. Uh, we also were critiquing the idea of accountability, increasingly accountability as upward accountability to large global and national institutions, but not so much downward accountability to the people who really matter at the grassroots. So we were bringing in that. Also foregrounding notions of cognitive justice, you know, talked about by scholars like Shiv Vishwanathan uh, and of course, uh, more recently by uh, Susa Santos and, and others, you know, trying to question the hegemony of scientific expertise and so on. It was a one week long jury process where agricultural scientists, experts, government bureaucrats, uh, multinational seed company executives came before this 19 member small farmer jury and testified yeah, to, to their visions. And in the evening, we would sit in small groups with uh, the farmer jury, uh, unpacking some of the testimonials, uh, playing the videos back again, uh, and letting them talk it out in response to the testimonies they have heard. And, and on the last day, uh, they, they have come up with uh, sort of a people's verdict on the agricultural action plan, uh, which is now part of a you know, report and you know, one could share it if people are interested, uh, called Prajatirpu in Telugu, meaning uh, people's verdict. Yeah? And the, the verdict was almost unanimously from the small farmers against the kind of corporate uh, agricultural vision that the government put in place. So this, this was one example where, you know, non-specialists could come together, examine visions of the future, establishing spaces and forums for their own debates and arbitration, generate new forms of knowledge to inform social, environmental, economic, public policy through the interaction of diverse social actors, including uh, local residents came forward to talk about uh, what does small farming mean, millet agriculture mean for urban uh, consumers, for their nutrition and food security and, and so on. Uh, so th this is one example of the kind of method that emerged from the sort of academic and community interaction. A second example, I'll quickly take two minutes, uh, Mohan, if it's okay. Uh, this, this same community that I'm talking about, the Deccan Development Society and the women farmers uh, that they are engaged with. Uh, a couple of years after this citizen's uh, jury was conducted, started an amazing filming project, uh, looking at uh, the uh, imposition of BT cotton uh, in, in Andhra on a large scale by the government in collaboration with corporate uh, uh, seed companies, multinational seed companies. Uh, what emerged was a one year long project led by pharma film producers uh, who were trained in uh, filmmaking, made an amazing film called Why Are Warangal Farmers Angry with BT Cotton? Now you look at that film and read a little bit about the method used to make that film, right? I mean, it comes out of that ethos of care and solidarity that I had mentioned 
uh, in the first round, uh, they continuously kept going back to Warangal, uh, one district where BT cotton was imposed on a large scale throughout the year. So it wasn't a one-time uh, filming episode. It wasn't an expose of an investigative journalism kind, but they kept going back repeatedly every few months to the field to record the experiences of BT cotton farmers in Warangal. And what came out was, uh, uh, you know, a story about uh, about 200 cotton farmers caught in the vicious cycle of pest attacks, pesticide resistance, mounting deaths, you know, ending up in mass suicides. I mean, a story that has been told quite a bit about Andhra Pradesh uh, uh, all over the world. And this film has then been, you know, part of an advocacy campaign within the state and uh, with the uh, UK, uh, whose international agency was supporting underwriting the Agricultural Action Plan, pressurizing DFID to withdraw funding to this Agricultural Action Plan, and they succeeded uh, in doing that. I mean, an amazing sort of micro-macro linkage uh, in academic solidarity. Again, our own department uh, communication was involved uh, in training some of these women in making these films, doing community radio and so on, and using these skills to talk about their own story. The film now exists in Swahili, in Bahasa, Indonesia, and many other languages, so that communities in those countries, in those regions, could use this narrative to fight against uh, you know, BT cotton and biotechnology in agriculture and so on, in, in their own communities, right? So this was a global solidarity movement led by women in this small village uh, in, in Telangana, right? And as academics, we only played uh, sort of, you know, uh, supportive roles on the margins, documenting, researching, uh, training where required to build their capacity that, and, and so on. Yeah? So I'll, I'll stop here with these two examples which suggests some pathways for academic solidarity with communities. Yeah, let me let me stop there. Sorry if I took a little longer one. Yeah. We know, thank you so much for sharing these powerful transformative examples. They are so inspiring, you know. Thank you. Uh, Pradeep. Fascinating example, we know. Um, the DDS. I know I'm. I'm also familiar with the work that they do, and some really strong women there, who made such a difference. Um, they're they're incredible, and if, if people haven't visited DDS, you should, because it's it's an experience to go there and visit these women who, you know, are autonomous, who are independent, who have done some fantastic work. And the great thing about them is that, you know, um, especially when it comes to academic community relationships, you know, they're on the they're on the front foot. Right, those communities are independent, right, and they they call the shots, and that is an amazing, in amazing situation to be in, right, and like like uh, Vinod said, you know, when you talk of solidarities, you've got to you know you've got to deal with those caveats as well, you know, with respect to uh, with academics and why they're involved in these kinds of issues and so on and so forth. Um, I think you know, over the last at least over the last forty or fifty years, the situation in countries like India have changed and. There are so many solidarity networks um, between NGOs and, and communities and the academic uh, fraternity and so on and so forth. And that never used to be the case in the, in the old days, right? Of course, the, I think left-oriented communities have always been there, but at least over the last uh, 30 or 40 years, this is, you know, there's been an incredible, incredible kind of, what should I say, uh, an efflorescence of these types of networks, right? Um, in 2010, I did a, a kind of book on on, on communication rights movements in India and looked at, uh, you know, a couple of different uh, rights movements, including the right to information, for example. You know, again, going back to what Vinod said, if you look at what the right to information did, especially people like Nikhil Day and Aruna Roy and, and, their, and, their, and their public forums, right, um, where, where people are, were enabled to speak, 
these were amazing solidarities right that 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 they that, that they kind of that they enabled and facilitated right and 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 i think to me that is that is one of the most successful solidarity movements in india right because it led to a national legislation it led to um, an extraordinary kind of outpouring of, of support for the right to information as a human right and so on and so forth right but there were others as well i mean whether it's in the community radio um, space or the gender uh, and 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 and, you know, and media space you know incredible solidarity is that that exist in the country i think you know we also recognize that the kind of preferential option for the poor um is not it continues to be not a, you know it does it does it's still not a an important imperative in academic circles in india and that's a reality but every once in a while in the context say of for example the covid crisis in south asia there are you know i've come across a number of really empathetic you know pieces of writing you know and solidarities um you know that that have come through and that have exposed the kind of massive divides that exists for example in the health services right which which is amazing i mean if you look at some of the writing that's been done in up and bihar and some of these other places you know they really have exposed um uh, the the divides that exist in health services and access to smartphones and there are these counter narratives um there are kind of emerging that there are questioning the development priorities of the state right and those are really empathetic pieces of writing right and with strong solidarities with the people who normally don't kind of pick you know who, who you know come into the frame at all uh, when we speak about development etc cetera, etc cetera. so covid really i think has 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 provided possibilities uh for for solidarities that never existed previously before a lot of people now understand you know covid in the context of of our failed development priorities in the state right of india right and that that is amazing that kind of thinking that is coming across right um i think there are also the solidarities that emerge from communities of practice and 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 i think vinod and his colleagues in that space of community radio uh have got some amazing amazing stories but also in the context of theory building uh there are these solidarities that have emerged you know of of, of late i've kind of been dealing or trying to read um uh, writings by gopal guru and sarukai in kind of dalit studies the dalit studies area and it's amazing kinds of solidarities there uh, that they are they are pushing for in the context of community building community theory building right um there there are kind of attempts to begin theory building on the basis of the dalit experience um of humiliation and marginalization so again a kind of you know a, a, you know the building of community there also recently um i've been trying to i've, I've been reading uh, work done by practitioners and you know I, some of you may know about tm krishna tm krishna is a carnatic vocalist right coming from the brahmin you know from the, a good brahmin family but fa fascinating fascinatingly involved in kind of cultural debates and cultural discussions and and you know dealing with caste in the carnatic world in in an amazing sort of way right creating solidarities especially you know breaking down the barriers between high culture and low culture bringing you know for example carnatic music music and local music to all sorts of stages in, you know from fishing communities to dalit communities so on and so forth to me all those things are fascinating and they so show a kind of the uh, the kind of vibrancy that there is in the context of solidarities in 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 south india uh, south asia at the moment um and 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 you know so i think there are different levels at which you can you know see these solidarities to me some of these are the more interesting ones that have emerged over the last say you know you know year or two so i leave it at that for the moment more I leave it at that uh, moment for the moment. Take over. Mahua. Thank you. I mean, those are brilliant examples. Thank you for sharing. I was learning so much as I was listening to you all. Um, 
I, I mean, what I will talk about uh, with regard to solidarity is mostly like the what it means to practice solidarity on the ground, like the theoretical meaning of solidarity, how we can interpret it uh, as part of our research practice. So, and I mostly draw from uh, John Beverly and Gayatri Spivak's uh, discussion on subalternity and representation and, uh, you know, what does it mean to practice solidarity on the ground? Uh, so drawing from them, it's solidarity is built on an act of friendship, founded upon honesty, transparency, accountability. And of course, the most important part is uh, we cannot begin with the idea of a pure conversation with communities or even romanticizing them, uh, nor does it simply allow the cultural members to speak for themselves and uh, address issues of representation because solidarity does not merely merge power differences between the researcher and the community members. So the goal of academic projects uh, uh, with a commitment to solidarity is not really to represent, but again, what, what are the challenges that come with it? And is, it, is that even possible? Uh, so again, the endeavor here is to recognize how the knowledge we construct is incomplete with the absences uh, and created by the impossibility of representing the subaltern, I, when I think of communities as organizations of struggle, of course, you know, I think of them uh, in the realm of subalternity. So in my field work, this is what I have tried to achieve uh, or tried, uh, tried for, uh, built on relationship building, uh, involving that involves a process of continuous self-reflection and recognition of uh, the agency of the people, of course. And all of these, you know, these are theoretical ideas. We all read about it, but what does it mean on the ground? What does it mean to even unlearn privilege, uh, which we have uh, read about, uh, which is pretty common for those of us who are in this kind of work. Uh, so this idea of, you know, displacement of power of the researcher, so it provides, of course, an entry point to rupture the dominant practice of uncritically accepting the representation of the subalterns by the state as agencyless and passive and decolonizing the knowledge of the other. Uh, and I think what is crucial to solidarity is really acknowledging that my relationship with the communities I'm working with is somewhat incom incompatible or incommensurable with my position in the elite academic enterprise that alienates them through its dominant system of knowledge production. So I think it is that dialectical tension that is very important for any kind of solidarity work. So it is essentially about uh, recognizing that tension, how our own practices create the very conditions of marginalization that communities find themselves in. Uh, and, and that is where the challenge becomes, I think, extremely, I mean, where it becomes very challenging, you know that, and yet in, in the act of publishing, probably we uh, kind of, you know, uh, we re refine that process. So the act of solidarity is, laying bare the academic practices and that of experts funding agencies as the very part of the problem in the ways in which they have historically located communities as passive fixing the agency of the community members in terms of uh, west centric stereotypes and serving the market logic of uh, international financial institutions uh, so that is solidarity for me and uh, in my field work, what I have noticed is there have been many moments of discursive closures where people have complete people have been defined, they have refused to talk to me, they have uh, ignored my presence and those moments of discursive closures have been the moments where that have made me very reflexive, made me aware of my 
uh, positionality, my class, uh, entitlement, my privileges. And so, of course, I mean, for sol solidarity for me is actually those moments of uh, closures, discursive closures that actually create entry point for reflection and create openings because when those moments of listening I have seen in from my experience how they actually uh, offered me avenues for building relationships. Uh, so again, uh, you know, to be self critical uh, as the experience, some of the experience experiences juxtapose my privileges against the marginalized status of the community uh, members. Um, so, and again, those moments also are important to think about the institutional violence that we are part of, or at least I am part of. Uh, so, the again, the imperative here for solidarity is to disembed ourselves for from the taken for granted conceptual categories. Uh, for in my case, uh, in my research with the farmers, of course, the meaning of land. Uh, that emerged, you know, what does it mean? Uh, because land for me or the world I come from is a commodity. And what does land mean to a farmer who has been displaced from the land? It is just not a property. It is a way of being that relationship with the land and that meaning, you know, to understand that meaning of land. Uh, and that was for me unlearning my privilege and and you know and really disembedding myself from my taken for granted conceptual categories uh, and and bringing the and trying to include the other meaning system into the dominant uh, academic practices uh, so all of that it is making way of uh, solidarity is again the you know uh, laying the groundwork for a two-way conversation and non-exploitative learning uh, intense self scrutiny uh, and remaining again open to the cons the cultural patterns, the conceptual categories that emerge from the field. Uh, and again, in in uh, I think Spivak's language or John Beverly's language and on and many others may have said it, that it is the idea of epistemic inversion. So that knowledge from the different communities they infuse the dominant institutions of the West. So thank you. To um, process really with what um, each of you have articulated, I'm not going to summarize just because I'm looking at the time right now. And I'm going to move us on to the next and final question, final prompt, which I, I think builds upon what you have already shared. And perhaps we can start with um, uh, you, Pradeep, and then go to you, Mahua, then Asha, and then Vinod. And that question is, what are the methodological imperatives that emerge from communities in the global south? Thank you, Morton. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, a, again, a fascinating question. All, all three questions have been really, um, really interesting. Um, and for me, um, you know, we al already, you know, we've had a couple of conversations around the need for understanding context, right? And I'm going, back, going to go back to context because the key issue here is understanding context. Methods emerge from understanding context. Right? That is so central. Um, and if you really look at um, the theory of social change, um, you've got these two broad approaches, right? Um, one that basically takes the view that individuals have the choice to rise above their circumstances. Um, that this is an evolutionary given and that the responsibility to do that is an individual's kind of you know, responsibility. So this is the kind of positive approach to social change. There's a more pessimist, pessimistic one and broadly Marxian, right? Um, and illustrated by Marx's famous uh, words in this kind of 18 Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, right? where he said, men those days, remember not women, but men, make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. The tradition of all dead generations weigh like a nightmare on the brains of the living, right? 
So dealing with context for me is about understanding those circumstances with a view to changing uh, them through effective interventions um, and how one en engages with those circumstances will differ from context to context. So for example, the, the circumstances of the Irulas um, are that you know they are completely on the margins. You know, they are the part of the precariat. Um, they are completely, you know, dependent on on you know either government support or very precarious existence doing seasonal um, farm work, or seasonal laborers, or working in the brick kilns um, uh, around Chennai. Um, and it's amazing to see their circumstances because you can see that they also live on common what's called Porumbok land. Right? They don't have, you know, land of their own. Right. So they're being pushed. They're being pushed by the big, uh, you know, special economic zones that are coming up all over where they stay, the big IT corridors. Um, in other words, the global market is a real presence in their lives, right? Um, and and so I think communities like the Irulas face major struggles because they're they you know they have not been kind of they they continue to remain unorganized. Right? They are not organized. And 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 I think you know when you when a, when a community is organized, you know you can deal with methods in clear kinds of ways. Right? When they're unorganized, it's a different it's a different kettle of fish altogether. Right? Um, and I think the Irulas at this particular moment in time are facing major struggles, kind of transition transitioning from their you know from their hereditary occupations like snake catching and rat catching to the modern economy. They remain on the edges of the market economy, and they just do not have the capital, social, political, cultural, um, to enter this new world on their own terms. So, in that kind of a context, and I've been doing some work on Paulo Freire, um, going back to my earlier work on Freire among you know farm, you know fishing communities and landless laborers in South India in the in the in the late eighties, there's an absolute need for critical literacies. Right? Without those critical literacies. It's absolutely it's going to be really difficult for people to understand their circumstances and and come out and and, and kind of uh, uh, and kind of frame their own methods to deal with those circumstances it's that's you know absolutely um, you know ab absolutely important but I think in order to understand context um, listening is absolutely critical right um, listening and I think so many of you have talked about listening listening to experience, um, observing everyday realities, um, cultivate listening as a methodology, right? Extraordinarily important in the context of the work that we do. Um, because at the end of the day, you need those authentic forms of dialogue that are based on listening. And some of you are aware of the book uh, by Wendy Quarry and Ricardo Ramirez, right? Um, and that book is, uh, the title is Communication for Another Development, Listening Before Telling, right? Um, important, important kinds of, uh, you know, lessons from people who've been working in the, in the kind of development area for 40 years to imagine that, you know, and they say that the key after 40 years, they, they say that one of the big gaps that exists is that people are not listening. The experts don't listen, right? It's all about telling, right? And I think at the end of the day, when we talk of methodologies and, and context and so on and so forth, um, you know, to, 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 we need to actually listen to local people about their own dreams, wishes and solutions related to social change. And for that, I really believe that, you know, there needs to be those critical literacies that, that, that are, are, you know, in many parts of India still non-existent, not just there. Um, and I, I really feel that people, you know, in the precariat, like the Irulas, absolutely need those literacies. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep. Mokuma, do you want to go next? Yes. Uh, thank you, Pradeep. Uh, so I think the imperative, uh, uh, I'll repeat, I think some of the points uh, I already mentioned when talking about solid solidarity uh, is, of course, you know, the goal of these projects uh, is uh, is to understand, of course, not from the modern Eurocentric perspective, 
but to what does it mean to understand from the perspective of a different rationality. Uh, it is not about speaking on behalf of the other in non-Western context. Uh, it's not that, but what does it mean to even think in terms of otherness? Uh, the complexities and impossibilities uh, in, involved in such projects. Uh, and it is very important to acknowledge that these uh, these projects are are marked by absences. Uh, and so what I have learned uh, from my experiences is mostly implications of silence, possibilities of discursive closures, and an openness to embrace the surprises from the field. So those have been uh, most important implication for praxis that have I have come across or from my own research experience. Uh, so first, uh, uh, these, uh, the pursuit of speaking with the communities must be accompanied by a mark of respect for the boundaries of silence that surrounds the community narrative. Uh, so it is to acknowledge the communities in their own right, rather than refine their existence for us. Uh, respecting silence means we do not subsume their meanings, their meaning system by Western canons, and that demands an ethic of respect. Uh, and, and it demands we do not try to fill in those gaps. Again, my, for my, when I was working um, for my research side, there were so many uh, moments when they just refused to talk to me. And with my presuppositions, with my assumptions, uh, it just, you know, and with my uh, training as a social scientist in the Western Academy, there were moments when I had taken for granted and that, that those are those self reflexive moments actually I realized those self reflections made me realize that I was actually trying to fill in, fill in those gaps. So it's very important we, we 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 realize that we are not it demands we do not attempt to fill in those gaps uh we do it demands we accept our project as incomplete uh, and it 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 challenges us to rethink what it means to know so uh uh and related it you know i already talked about discursive closure i think that is a very important also uh point to remember that discursive closures, uh, the, uh, the silences of cultural members may lead to discursive closures. And those are also great openings for, uh, for self reflection, and they, they actually open up more questions, those moments of self inquiry and soul searching. So, uh, uh, and then uh, the a level of preparedness to embrace the surprises in the field, because uh, the goal is again not to impose our thinking onto the subaltern or bring agency to the subaltern of course so in my case i've seen you know i wanted to talk to the farmers one to one but then they all came together and they sat under a tree and started talking to me and i was thinking at that moment of, of my irb uh, uh what i have my IRB approval, I did not have anything like that. It was one to one conversation that ha that I had approved for my research, but I had to be open to what the field was offering me. Uh, so, so, and I eventually call that the emergent focus group. And this was the question that reviewers asked me that if you are uh, open to surprises in the field, how are you dealing with IRB? And for this reason, I needed supportive reviewers and editor who understood what it meant. Uh, so, and that is what I was talking about earlier. At every step, the academic practices create uh, subalternity. So the emergent focus groups in my field work uh, is one such surprise. Another surprise for me was the multi-sited field work, uh, which I did not anticipate at all uh, because 
they were deciding and what does it mean because again my irbi had certain you know uh, uh, approvals for having the ways in which i would have conversation but the farmers not only that way establish their authority in the field but they also uh they determined their relationship status with me on their own terms so each site if it is under a tree if it is welcoming to their home uh, so that is actually all of these meant something their expression of trust their keenness to welcome me into their world or whether they are completely rejecting me whether they are being defiant uh, and embracing these surprises allows for a process of representation that establishes them on their own rights on their terms uh, so these situations again locating agency in the communities these are these are uh, perhaps some of the ways to do that uh, and again uh, these are also moments because i wasn't uh, prepared for any of that and i hadn't gone there uh, armed with these tools and you know with a toolkit but these are uh, some of the moments again that taught me how i'm very much complicit with a certain dominant structure and again what it meant to unlearn my privilege so this is uh, and also these moments uh, offered me ways to critique from within the institutions being reflexive of my own practices and what does this and reinscribe that ethical commitment? Um, and finally, I think uh, I'll just say one thing, uh, which is I think all the examples I was listening to, I was just thinking of this uh, one point which drives me uh, on this particular research program. You know, while neoliberalism has, I think, uh, market logic has proven to be quite a challenge for. Uh, academics like us uh, uh several sections i mean several sections of society and the examples that you gave all of like most of the examples uh, several sections of society are fully mobilized uh because they live in their flesh the effects of this politics and if we can listen to them and if we know no ways to engage uh, with the communities, then I believe those are the ways to uh, transformative possibilities to inscribe a new social order. Uh, because people who are facing the brunt of development, brunt of neoliberal politics, they can tell us the best how to think of a different world order. And I think that is, for me, the, the imperative. Uh, and I talked about Chipko earlier, you know, Chipko tells us that movement uh, tells us the what relationship we can envision between the nature, the organization and the polity, a completely new way, new ways to think about this relationship. Uh, so I think, I think that is what I have. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Mohan. There is so much to process there. Um, Asha? Okay, thank you so much. I think uh, a lot of the points have, uh, have uh, I mean, uh, Mahuya and uh, Pradeep have uh, covered a lot of the points, uh, very important uh, points uh, uh, when we talk about the communities in the Global South. But I would like to just focus on three different um, just highlighting a, a, a three, I mean, a lot of this I've, I've spoken uh, earlier. So the first one, the first point that relates to uh, uh, histories or context, right? So the lived experiences of the communities that can only be studied through context, right? So understanding of the context, understanding of the history, the background, yeah, the, the, back, the collective, uh, uh, the shared beliefs and, and, and collective uh, that leads to collective action or, or collective understanding, right? Um, so that would be the first point in understanding. Uh, at least this resonates with the, the, the communities that I have been uh, working with, right? So um, 
and, and that has to um, be studied within a larger framework, right? So when you're talking about the histories, it's the communities against the larger uh, uh, population of that country, right? So that, that goes back to history and, and uh, the struggles and, and the resistance and all of those. The second point, of course, uh, when we talk about imperatives, I think it, it goes back to using the participatory uh, action research or, or the community model or framework, uh, uh, which again uh, links to the social justice framework right so it's about respecting the communities it's about listening to the communities uh it's about uh you know adapting to the situation and every community so this is again something that every every community is different and they have their own ways uh so to that situation adapting to that to the condition and circumstances, I think that is what makes um, uh, the, the project, uh, knowledge construction, uh, comes from understanding the different situations, the different circumstances. Um, and the third point I would like to make uh, is the part on storytelling, right? So storytelling and the space give them um, the, uh, the the essence of storytelling, right? So uh, and in this kind of interviews, I mean, sometimes when we we, we when we look back at the Arab and we say it's to an our essence uh, of the the um, the importance of listening to the communities, and and that has to happen in in this kind of uh, uh, projects uh, that deals with the marginalized communities in the global south. Thank you, uh, Vinod. Thanks, Mohan. Um, yeah, I think all the previous speakers have. Uh, pretty much summarized uh, a, a lot of the imperatives for us. Uh, let, let me just start by a quick uh, example of something that we were doing in the late uh, 90s and early 2000s when a lot of us uh, communication media academics and also civil society activists were pushing the government of India to open the airwaves to communities as part of that sort of national campaign for community radio. Uh, after a while, I realized that mostly in this uh, seminar rooms and around policy tables, it was a bunch of academics and activists sitting and uh, you know banging the table and making our points without actually community voices there. Uh, and one of the things that I started doing uh, very quickly into that campaign is to have a community partner with me, uh, especially uh, this, this rural community that I was talking about, Deccan Development Society. Uh, you know, there was this young woman, uh, General Narsama, uh, who is now uh, grown into a full blown uh, community broadcaster in her own right, station manager, and so on, but still in her teens, young woman, uh, and uh, you know, someone who had studied up to class 10. Uh, and a Dalit woman. Uh, so she would come along with me to many of the national and international uh, platforms where we were making a case for India to open up uh, airwaves to communities. And uh, after a while, I mean, I said, you know, why don't you just speak and I'll do the translation? You know, because nothing that I said, uh, you know, matched the powerful. Uh, testimonial and narrative that Narsama could provide. Uh, and in many ways, it was also addressing, uh, I think, uh, what uh, Miranda Fricker had called uh, testimonial injustices uh, in, in our uh, you know, academic and research work, that we silence the voices of those who actually matter uh, and bury them in 
heavy going academic interpretation and theorizing and so on. So we, we decided that we will let Narsama speak. And her powerful voice asking for communities right to broadcast is the one that really worked in our in our campaign. I mean, so she quickly became sort of a you know poster girl for community radio in India. Uh, now, one of the, uh, I mean, th there are several lessons to learn from that experience and subsequent uh, experiences of uh, academics working with communities in our own work. Uh, one is, of course, what Mahua and others have already talked about, uh, this idea of cognitive and epistemic justice combined with uh, the imperative of social justice. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really central to, to this uh, collaboration between academics and, and communities. Uh, I think uh, Miranda Flicker again talks about epistemic justice as a condition of political freedom. Yeah, it's not just about an esoteric epistemological issue. Yeah, it, it's bound up with uh, real issues of political freedom. Uh, that's one uh, very important uh, thing to underline here. The second thing what Pradeep has already outlined and just to uh, back up what he was saying is uh, what uh, the Malawian scholar Linje Manyozo calls the pedagogy of listening. Right? It, it's so central to this work. Right? I mean, it's a framework that, that involves uh, sort of a phenomenological introspection, uh, reflection, if you will, of one's own standpoint, uh, methods that allow you to get closer to the interpretive lenses of uh, the subalterns and, and emancipatory methods that, that help us amplify people's sense of agency yeah, in, in their, their search, uh, I mean, again, a very Freudian kind of terms, their, their search to reclaim their own place in the world, right? I mean, as, as Freire put it, to, in, their, in their quest to be fully human, yeah, what kind of emancipatory methods would, would you adopt? Right? I mean, that's, that's a real ongoing uh, academic search and I think Mao is absolutely right about the, the need to negotiate one's way uh, into the field uh, with adequate respect. Uh, I mean, right now, uh, a PhD student of mine is working with the community uh, to, to negotiate entry into the field and lots of tough questions, uh, you know, that you need to address. What are you going to do with this knowledge? I mean, what will you do with people's knowledge that you will collect during this process? You know, uh, how extractive is this going to be? You know, what kind of sharing methods are you going to put into your, your field work and, and so on, right? And I think one needs to uh, very consciously address, raise these questions in one's field work and see how you can foreground principles of inclusivity, participation, uh, address what uh, Mahua has talked about, what Mohan uh, had uh, discussed in his own work, you know, addressing discursive erasures. Uh, and finally, I would also say, are there ways of building people's own research capacities? Uh, very often I find in participatory communication work, while uh, data collection uh, seems to incorporate various kinds of participatory methods, it ultimately doesn't seem to leave the communities with capacities for doing their own community research. Yeah? How does one work with people's own capacities uh, to, to strengthen those capacities for doing research on their own? Right? Locating agency at the center of the research process. Yeah? And, and leaving behind a, a certain capacity for community-based research at, at, on their own without the outsider researcher entering. I mean, this, this is an ongoing challenge. Some of us are trying to find ways around it, uh, ways to address this, uh, but we can uh, talk about it if, if there is some time. I'll leave it there, uh, Mohan. Great. 
thank you all uh, so much, each one of you. I'm looking at uh, the time and we are uh, just at 3 um, uh, p.m. here in Aotearoa. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that um, um, uh, has a question? Maybe we will take one question from the audience. Okay, if not, I will just quickly uh, summarize, um, uh, you know, the, the, your beautiful uh, Correro and uh, sort of some takeaway points, at least from me, uh, from the uh, reflections. Thank you, know, um, uh, Mohua, you uh, really talked about this notion of, um, uh, you know, coming from a place of um, uh, understanding the complexities and uh, impossibilities um, in this work, right? That this uh, work is fraught with impossibilities and recognizing uh, those impossibilities are uh, uh, starting points. Um, uh, you talked about, um, you know, recognizing that uh, any kind of projects with communities are marked by absences, marked by silences, uh, discursive closures, and, and these themselves become openings for intervening into the hegemonic structures of knowledge production. You talked about the openness to um, embracing uh, surprises um, and sort of the ways in which that then uh, creates registers for, uh, you know, starting by recognizing that our methods need to be about understanding communities and building registers that are held by communities in their own terms. The terms are held by communities. Pradeep, you talked about, you know, the notion of critical literacies and how important it is to build these registers for um, uh, critical literacies and sort of working through those critical literacies to understand the circumstances and contexts uh, that shape everyday lived experiences. And then you also talked about how vital it is to build registers for listening. You know, we are all too aware when uh, doing work in our communities about the struggles to create these registers for listening, even when uh, we have a lot of lip service to listening, you know. Um, Asha, you talked about again, you know, um, aligned with what Pradeep was saying in terms of uh, the importance of the histories and the contexts um, and uh, connecting those histories and contexts to storytelling, recognizing the power of communities to tell their stories and through that uh, building registers for listening to these stories. Um, uh, Vinod, you brought us back to the notion of um, epistemic uh, justice and you gave that beautiful example of General Narsaman, the ways in which her presence in those spaces becomes a way for disrupting, witnessing what counts as evidence and really builds a register um, uh, for um, uh, sort of imagining political freedom and emancipation. You talked about, um, you know, thinking through pedagogies of listening, once again, connecting with um, uh, Pradeep. And um, you also discussed, you know, what will uh, people's knowledge and people's methods of generating knowledge look like? And uh, finally, you left us with this opportunity to think through what does it mean for us to build capacities for researching uh, in communities so that they define methods in their own terms and uh, find registers for intervening into structures of knowledge production. Um, is there anything else that you want to say as a way of wrapping up? Um, I, I, this is this has been a very rich, you know, experience listening to my fellow panelists. Um, um, and and I think at the end of the day, I think you know, we are in a situation where you know, especially in a country like India, right? We, you know, there are communities that are that are organized and self-aware, and like for example, DDS, the women in DDS are amazing. Um, they are they are critical scholars in themselves, right? Um, you know, they 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 teach other people. Right? Uh, we are in a situation with that community, you know, um, in that kind of space. But there are also lots of unorganized communities, yeah, where you don't have those critical literacies. You don't have that kind of awareness, right? And the question for me is always, you know, um, how do you deal with those, in, you know, communities in these kinds of informal spaces, right? Because there are literally in a country like India, and I think COVID has exposed this in a big way. There are those, you know, massive 
uh, populations of these informal communities all over the country, right? Who've not been connected to academic networks and solidarity networks, et cetera, et cetera. And I think one of the biggest challenges is to how do you kind of reach out to those communities, right? Who are really part of that precariat, who are part of those edges, right? And to me, you know, it, it really comes down to those critical literacies about, you know, if we, if we talk about methods, you know, how can these communities evolve their own methods, right? And, and, and what needs to be, you know, what kind of interventions need to be done to support these communities who are really at the, at the kind of, you know, the most marginalized of communities in the country. So it's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, we need to come back to. Yeah. Mahua, Vinod, Asha, did you want to uh, say anything else as we wrap up? Just one quick point. Talking about epistemologies of the South, that democracy and capitalism, they are incompatible. Before I read that in Foucault, I learned that from the farmers. They told me that democracy and capitalism are incompatible from their own experiences. So what we can learn from people on the ground, I mean, that is very rich philosophy. We need to embrace that. So that was my thought. Okay. Nothing else to add, but I was, I was, uh, I'm just going back to uh, this reflection. Uh, you, you know, um, I think it says a lot, right? So culture is community and community is culture. So with that, I would like to just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. We know the last word is yours. <laughs> so just to thank uh, fellow panelists for such a rich conversation early morning here in India. It, it really woke me up and stimulated me for the rest of the day. And thanks, uh, Mohan, for organizing uh, such a wonderful panel. And I really enjoyed uh, being here. Thank, thanks, everyone. Thank you. It's been our honor. Once again, it's been great to have you. We